Chapter five, education. The education of black men has changed drastically over the past several years. The definitions and responsibilities of compulsory public education has also been altered depending on the social politics regarding its value, which often changes every four years. Teachers and instructors have been required to incorporate their teaching techniques with lessons on self-control and to also function as disciplinarians. Children are now showing up for class dressed inappropriately, sleepy, carrying no utensils for participation, loud and unruly, disrespectful and combative. Teachers find beneath all these layers of personally personality deficiencies that black children score low and remember little of what they learned in their previous years of school and are indifferent to approaching new topics of learning. Teacher salaries are too low, wage increases are bleak and many have left for better paying positions in the private sector. Hall monitors are replaced with police or security guards and many teachers have been attacked by irate parents and terrorized by students. The era of schools being a happy, fun-filled, organized institution is over. Public schools now, especially from ninth grade on up, feel lucky if they can keep attendance at a decent level to justify their existence and feel blessed if they can just get all other children to stop talking at the same time, or at least long enough for them to take the role. Fewer children take books home or complete homework Parents rarely show up at PTA or other school functions, and all involved agree that public education has failed. The overall scholastic achievement of the Black male is reportedly at its lowest ebb since 1954 when the Supreme Court declared segregated schools and recreational facilities unconstitutional. Hard civil rights and legal battles were fought yearly to secure what the black men of the early 1960s perceived as equal opportunity to education. These moves signal a new better chance to gain knowledge and skills that will prepare black men for acceptance into the American workforce. Many blacks benefited by integrating predominantly white colleges and universities and managed to uncover learn more from the more qualified teachers and professors who now headed their classes. Busing elementary black children into white schools located in white neighborhoods was very traumatic but was doggedly accomplished. This penetration was complicated and no studies were made to determine the psychological adjustment black children had to make to comply with their parents and school board requests of forcing them into places where they were not wanted. By 1965, Black men leaders, prompted by college youth and educators, demanded that Black studies be included in curriculums, especially on the college level. A frantic search for Afro-American historical data ensued, which included modification of dress codes to accept Black men's rights to wear their hair in the then popular Afro hairstyles. Black curriculums were hastily thrown together, including a few black men scholars, scientists, post-slavery politicians, and a few courageous slaves who accompanied remarkable feats while enslaved. This also opened up new teaching positions for black professors hired to direct and teach these new black study courses. Black writers of that period, such as Leroy Jones and Marie Baraka, Don L. Lee, Haku Mahubati, Etheridge Knight, Dudley Randall, Ralph Ellison, and Francis Fernand, Black men were thirsty for knowledge about themselves and were eager to learn. The new project of studying Black history uncovered many discrepancies in what Black men had been taught. On the university level, many of these misleading documentations were dispelled. However, on the elementary, junior, and senior high levels of American public schools, Few changes were made in the methodology of teaching American or world history to Black children. So while many of the adult Black men of that era cleared up a lot of their misunderstandings about their real achievements and potential, the oncoming younger generations did not have this information imparted to them. By 1975, 
faces and drawings of Afro-Americans began showing up in elementary level textbook, but all else remained the same. The same history was taught with black faces added. As it turned out, the popularity of the black pride and black history studies began to subside. And as the fads and trends of civil unrest faded, so did excitement and interest about black history. Bored white hippies disintegrated and their, commu their communes disappeared. They grew older, became bored with their rebellion and returned to school to eventually assume the places prepared for them by their parents and society. The debunking of the civil rights industry shortly followed. On the trail of the dwindling participation of the Vietnam War, the youthful black man leaders without adult leadership representation caused the black pride movement to become tired and unfashionable and finish. Gone went the African clothes, symbols and poetry and they were replaced with bell bottom pants, disco lights and mini skirts. American businesses, as usual, resume. The more outspoken Black man leaders were quieted either by murder, political appointment, business ventures, or jail. The existence of specialized daycare centers for Black children dwindled. Government funding was withdrawn and only a few unwavering Black man leaders continued the struggle. As an oversight, this was the only period in the Black man's background that would have permitted him to establish his own unintegrated schools where he could teach his own Black history. This was his immediate chance to pass on to his children their real legacy by teaching them what he had learned about Black pride, but he blew it. He did not opt for single control of his own schools on the elementary level, even in his own community. He did not insist on remaining in charge of the curriculums Black children would be taught from. Black men leaders moved on to other political notions pertaining mostly to adults. They parlayed all of their mental energies toward voter registration and lobbying for expanded civil rights. He made no preparations for the oncoming Black generations and he formulated no new standards for Black family home life. Instead, he played his hope and faith in his dreams that the ballot and equal employment opportunities, along with social integration, would solve all his problems. He made no effort to redirect Black dollars into Black businesses, and he made no attempts to restructure Black traditions, holidays, or celebrations for his children. He left everything intact. His educational demands consisted of better school buildings, recess materials, school lunches, immunizations, and health care, sports teams that included Black males, and integrated teaching staffs in classrooms. He continued to depend on the government, the state, and the city to teach his children. He has always done this. Back in the day, during pre- and post-slavery periods, the Methodists, the Quakers, and the Presbyterians were the first whites to establish Black schools. Their presence of authority, whether they were sympathizer or not, wedged them into positions to teach and instill European histories and values, ideas, customs, and religions into the minds of Black children. The white female, dedicated and prim, was in charge of serving the plates of education the Black children ate from. This was an honorable work and dictated the format for maintenance at school. There were independent Black-owned and operated schools who felt compelled to maintain the standards approved and taught by whites. They were, of course, understaffed and under-equipped. And they were mostly taught by women while the men worked on other locations to earn money to support their families. This pattern has just today become under closer scrutiny as many new style black men educators have started to realize that by the time they inherit a black male in high school, after several years of being taught by white and black women, that it is often too late to effectively teach him ideals and values he needs as a man. They are now trying to establish programs enabling them to reach black male youth early in age to try to make a masculine impact on their character development during their formative years. More on this later. Part of the black man's problem concerning him establishing concerning him establishing his own educational system is that he does not know how to do it independently Certainly financing such as an arrangement has its weights in the project, but next to that is his confusion regarding what to teach. 
What source will he use to teach the thematic sequence of black history? And how can he teach this information and still turn out black youth qualified to enter a European manned workforce to get a job? On the tail end of his dilemma is his concern that whites may not approve of him trying to form his own school. So much had already been put into motion for progress through integration. How can he abandon all this without sending a message that might be misread as hostile or rejection of European values. If the black man was able to objectively analyze Western approaches to this topic and subjectively deduce the principles needed to establish his own standards for cultural transmission, he would be successful. This is not to suggest that the black man copy all of the white man's means and methods, but there are two major, re major reasons to do this. Number one, accomplishments are made by using formulas that contain instructions and principles to achieve certain goals. Number two, there is no point in spending any more time searching throughout history to replicate ancient ideas now extinct and uncompetitive in today's high tech scholastic environment. As an example, this is how the European implanted his ideas for permanency. One, he programmed all the people with the same information taught the same sequence of history, used the same names, places, and dates, and supplied events to document them as reality. Two, more documentation was provided in books, literature, arts, preservation of artifacts, and pictures of his white male leaders. Three, he further defined his system of democracy, rules of trade, formed his monetary system, decreed laws and legal recourse, named his religion and anointed his holidays, and made moral judgments regarding home and family life. Four, then he appointed able-bodied men to be in charge of each and every territory he claimed so that they could monitor the continued development of his ideas, to stay visible, to keep the people on track, to reinforce his guidelines for setting up communities, and to evoke the rules if someone strayed from the plan. He called this politics, labeled the members of the board politicians, and hired them to govern the people. If analyzed emotionally, they did a magnificent job one worthy of respect by those who use this kind of achievement as a measure of success. There is one word which best describes what the Europeans did. That one word is agree. They agreed among themselves on the strategies to reach their goal. They acted on their commitments and followed through on the plan. Yes, some of their methods were unconscionable, unconscionable but their plan worked. Today they own American and plot its destiny. They designed their style of education based on the same principles they used to build their nation. They put variations of their history in their school books and continually drum this information into the brains of every school age child in America. This is the way to educate someone into believing in something as a way of life and to inspire them to defend and feel allegiance towards the institution giving them citizenship. It works. So there is no way to save blackmail you from destruction by their own design until the black man takes charge of dictating what it is that they will learn. Each resurgence of ideas about studying or hailing black history produces new scholars and historians who uncover or report new information. They deserve evaluation. The first step the black man must make is to come together with other concerned black men and determine a definite format for teaching black history, black culture, black ethics, and black celebrations. He would have to decide on the wording, do the writing himself, and print and distribute the books. These books would become mandatory documents from which every black child would learn and study. Parents would be required to reinforce this information at home and keep the ideas in the forefront of the child's everyday life in entertainment, meals, recreation, bedtime stories, wall signs, emblems, pictures, and every other symbol in the home must reflect these impressions. The teachers in the school who accept the responsibility of tattooing the brains of black children with this information must make it a lifetime work and assemble written reports of each child's progress in problem areas so that the next generation of teachers would add more pressure in the weak areas. These teachers should consist of men for the boys and women for the girls up until the youth reach their late teens. Currently, black male boys are presented with so much conflicting information about themselves and others that their little brains are overloaded. A new plan is undeniably needed. The suggested approaches above would have to be worked out detail by detail by those appointed. Progress and monitoring are a must. 
Installing this system could take 30 to 50 years. This is a serious undertaking and there will be no time for sports or play. While this project sounds heavy and riddled with complications, African-Americans uniformly admit that the public and private school systems have failed. Statistic takers report that one of every five black boys will not complete high school. And those remaining have a tendency to not pay rapt attention, get good grades, or muster up enough genuine interest to appreciate the experience. Public schools have become battlegrounds for drugs, prostitution, fights, shootings, delinquency, pregnancy, diseases, extortion, murder, intimidation, distraction, and promiscuity. And to top it all off, Black youth know about as much about Black history today as Black youth did in 1954. They come out of school unable to read, write, or do simple math. They are categorized on the national scales as functionality illiterate or learning disabled. For the most part, there is nothing unrepairably wrong with their brains when they start kindergarten. Yet around fourth or fifth grade, they commence to exhibit fact retention problems. Little black girls have a similar problem that brews in their teen years. Today's generation of teenage black girls are the most immoral, fickle, unprincipled, silly, and raunchy young women on the scene. They have the most filthy mouths of any other female population ever to produce from the African-American community. They shame any civilized adult black woman because of their low class behavior and gross ignorance. The equally outrageous behaviors of young black male teenagers is covered in another chapter. A separate series of black educational facilities on the elementary level is desperately needed. Many black American citizens object to this as if the idea is blasphemous and suggesting, suggestive of succeeding the union. The idea of establishing an all black school is not a new one. Booker T. Washington did his best to impress Negroes that they should always maintain their own learning and training centers in the 1800s. He was rejected because Negroes even back then wanted to integrate with whites educationally. The next time a major separate black school specifically designed to serve the unique needs of black youth emerged was in the early 1940s established by Elijah Muhammad under the rulership of the nation of Islam. His idea was rejected too this time based on his racial politics. This is not to suggest that there had never been any attempts to establish black owned or black operated schools or colleges, but all the rest of them are fashioned after and are functionary using the same information dispersed in the regular public school system. The government insists on certain prerequisites that must be met in order to be considered certified or authorized to qualify for and receive federal or state funds allocated for general public education. Any school not meeting the set requirements is unable to obtain grants or research awards. So even if the school does claim to be a black academy of sorts, none of them have figured out how to be financially independent of the system and therefore are under the same guideline as any other public institution, although modified cosmetically to appear solely ethnic. Black men leaders in educational positions of authority or as teachers do not think that they are qualified to take over their own school system and have complete control over what African-American children are taught. Black History Month is in February. Dr. King's birthday is celebrated in January. There's a tiny bit of recognition. The rest is gleaned from TV, movies, record albums, sports stars from watching the people outside their doors and the people inside their homes. Not much positive imagery can be gotten out of such tunnel vision with no specific directions regarding interpretation of how black men are portrayed in society. They may as well now receive any exposure at all. So any partially intelligent black adult recognizes the need for blacks to establish their own schools, separate ones, ones for the black boys and ones for the black girls with black male and black female teachers. In August of 1991, a few educators around the country created quite a media stir for suggesting that black boys need separate educational facilities to address their special needs. There are only a few of these types of schools allowed to exist, but fearing a trend, the public outcry against them from both feminists and liberals soon a court of law informed these few black men that they could do no such thing. After a few days of protests from the sponsors of the separate black school idea for black boys, the issue was dropped. As usual, things went back to normal. Many parents and female teachers spoke out in support of the schools, but their experience and recommendation were ignored and disregarded. 
as they have always been. While it may be understandable why the public school system disagreed with this idea and slightly explainable why some black and white females were against it, it is totally inconceivable why every black man in America did not stand up and demand that they be allowed to teach and train their own sons as every other nationality on earth has the right to do. Black men know they got little, if anything, out of their public school experience or college campus life that serves or benefits them today or help them define their identity and purpose or manhood. They know they were not taught anything about the role or responsibility of a black man, but as usual, Black men heard about the separate school issue and cowardly slinked out of sight and pretended that whatever else they were doing was more important. They are now using a reverse psyche on themselves as a form of denial. For example, they say they have been duped into, into thinking that they have special problems, but they are just as normal as the next fellow and they are not going to go for stories and innuendo at that they have unique problems indigenous, indigenous only to black males. The error in their analogy is that the newspapers, TVs, and jailhouses validate every day and night that they do indeed have some kind of a special problem. Every black man father or father to be in America should have stood up and supported the few black man education, educators who were bold enough to stake a public claim for the minds of black boys. They defended their positions well to no avail. No other well-known popular black men leaders came out in support of them. No sport heroes, no actors, no politicians, no civil rights activists. The same kind of handkerchief head Negro man who failed to support or start separate schools for black children 30 and 40 years ago continue to avoid the issue today. And this time they are accompanied by their chicken hearted grown sons who also do not take part in any issue involving motions that require them to be responsible for their own children. These charges are leveled at every black man in America because they should have stood up and supported those few black men educators who were negotiating with the government for the brains of black boys. Certainly every black male school teacher should have voiced their support and wrote letters. The sponsors of the separate school made a fatal mistake. The same mistake black men have been making for 90 years. They keep asking the white man for permission to exert their own ideas. They should have endured solicited funds from blacks in sports and entertainment and petitioned the umpteenth million black service organizations who claim they are working for the good of the people. If the black man believed that God was on his side, he would have courage to execute his own ideas despite the political opposition of other races. The truth of the matter is that the black man has been taught so long to go against his nature that it makes him cringe when faced with making significant decisions because every decision he makes for himself requires him to reject the rules already ingrained in him by Europeans. The most important outcome of having black men teach black boys is that it hopefully will produce a better breed of black men more qualified to marry, protect, and direct black women. Our black girls also need special attention in the development of femininity, home economics, child rearing, and general education skills. This is not to say that black girls should be taught less important information than black boys, but it does suggest that if these things are going to get back to normal, then black men must be trained to provide and rule, and black women must be taught how to be a wife and mother to rear a more authentic generation. Whites have always maintained separate schools of their male offspring. They maintain them under the guise of referring to them as boarding schools, military academies, the YMCA or Boy Scouts, but they have always existed and all teach codes of behavior, honor, religion, defense, responsibility, and patriotism. They boast of graduating some of America's top leaders and many successful businessmen. These units provide a male field environment without the distraction of females, outside competition or interference of popular social trends. The black man must also have these kinds of institutions for his own young males. European adult males made this decision independent of the regular public school system and needless to say, did not ask or seek permission from black men. They evokes natural law, which dictates that a man has a right to raise his son in any manner he chooses, as long as it does not conflict with the rights of others. A man who wants his own seed to survive must teach himself worth and the value of his life by dedicating his own life to transferring this information to his offspring. The black men who graduate from African-American colleges are ultimately not in any better condition than the ones who attend European-ran universities. They matriculate, seek positions, 
preferably somewhere near the Fortune 500 or other corporate appropriate affiliation. Then launch into giving every drop of brain power they have to a European firm for as long as they permit them to. Many of the younger graduates are determined to get a better job than their fathers. Most of their parents present, excuse me, most of their parents sent them to college to qualify for that singular accomplishment to get a good or better job. Every educational aim black men have had for the past years has been motivated by him trying to prepare himself to get a gig in one of the European owned existing operations. Even those who go who do go into business do not feel comfortable in their careers unless they are integrated as far as possible into the European equation of their selective vocation. Some even hire whites due to government cutbacks and affirmative action stipulations many black men are finding it not as easy to snuggle in the warm armpits of the European corporate body. The black man is the original form of human life to first sur surface on earth. He used to be the most peaceful and most powerful ruler on the planet, but he has dropped to his lowest level ever recorded. And until he replaces the information that led him to the spot he is in today, his current endangerment will develop into his extinction. Television is partially responsible for the miseducation of black youth. Studies say that 9% of an American's child life is spent on education. 91% is spent watching television and playing sports or video games. Yearly, this breaks down into 11,000 hours per year spent on school and 18,000 hours starring at a TV set. Television programs teach values, standards, ethics, sexuality, ways to commit crimes, loopholes in the law, styles of dress, how to make excuses, how to get out of doing things, how to kill people, how to torture animals, how to smuggle drugs, how to rape or mug, integration, religion, and zillions of other immoral and illegal activities. The messages of violence and situation ethics are no longer considered subliminal. The easy availability of cable provides easy access to X-rated movies at any time of the day or night. Television is a teaching tool. Television also teaches envy, inadequacy, and jealousy. TV is not a real world, but a black child who spends hours daily admiring and longing for the rich living lifestyles portrayed on television is more apt to look at his own surroundings and feel inadequate, develop, resent develop resentment for people who live in luxury, and become obsessed with obtaining material possessions that he learns from the television to equate with success. The VCR machine is not much better. Movies are easily rented and many a child and adult is under the video spell, hypnotized by watching hours of motion pictures with no commercial breaks. Few children have been educated on how to watch TV. First of all, every program on television is designed and specifically geared to attract consumers to see commercials to sell stuff. They provide a constant review of products repeated on the average of every three to five minutes. It's easy enough to claim that Blacks always get to the poorest, most degrading roles on TV. But Black actors are not forced to take any part. So if they keep showing up in low-grade roles, it's because they chose to, either for the money or raw exhibi exhibition purposes. Black men are back acting in movies now. Spike Lee melted the ice a few years back, and since that time, history is repeating itself. Back in the 60s, due to the civil rights movement, Blacks were given new opportunities to break into Hollywood and star in movies. After a few brief years of being given the chance to act out their warped fantasies on the widescreen and stories about drugs, pimps, karate heroes, sweaty slaves, gangsters, dope addicts, and Black versions of monster movies, Black, actor fell, black actors fell from grace with the theatrical world. The movies became more and more pointless slid to being ignorant and ended up being remembered as plain silly. Today, the same thing is happening in the same insidious way. Black men and Black women are starting to show up in unrealistic, comedic, or crime-laden roles. The producers of these films say they present stories featuring actual Black lifestyles currently going on. If they are currently going on, then African Americans already are familiar with the plots and climaxes. If movies are going to ever be viewed as educational tools and they should write scripts showing what black life should be as opposed to the confusion it's in today. The black filmmakers have another unique chance while they have the attention of the public to produce creative pictures of new images and positive ideals. If they don't do this, it won't be long before they obliterate it from the big show again.
Remember that movies like television are concocted to attract movie lovers who will spend money to go see a movie. When any particular topic or image loses its drawing power, they move on to the next prevailing attraction. They should be making films about African-Americans to sell to the schools and movies featuring capitalism tricks for the black dollar and attention. The subjects are endless. Every movie, video, television show, or picture poster teaches something and conveys a meaning. Academic, academicians, academicians, report that black boys respond poorly in math. Math produces analytical skills sadly missing in black men. Math has rules which must be remembered throughout the problem, throughout the solving of a problem. This is a thinking process that black men do not have. When engaged in various types of encounters, both positive or negative in nature, they do not know the rules to call on to make value judgments or arrive peacefully at a solution each time they encounter the same type of problem. The basic tenets of math are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Theoretically, they signal addition, when to do more or give, subtraction, when to stop or pull, multiply, when to join, build on, divide, separation, and elimination. Math teaches life coping skills and how to keep certain values and standards in mind when working through conflict or confusion. Like math, when these skills are known and practiced, the answer comes out right. This is an example of a way that mathematics can be used to teach Black youth the importance of learning rules and how to use them. Meanwhile, each year, thousands of Black men graduate from college and cannot find employment to exercise their newly acquired skills. Unless the introduction of education is altered to become a more usable and tangible tool, it would become extremely difficult to continue to convince Black youth of the value of getting an education. Because when they get out of school, having such knowledge as they receive now, if they can't secure a job, the education proves to be a waste of time and money. They are not trained to do anything with an education but to seek employment working for you know who. Some are in debt from hefty student loans which they can't pay back because they can't find work. Black men learn attitudes and information from many sources. One of the more unusual ways is through superstitious nonsense. The ones they say are the most familiar with originate from Judeo-Christian lore. They are one. Well, black cats, while well, black cats were considered lucky during the times of Egyptian pharaohs, later in Europe in the Middle Ages, black cats came to stand for evil and bad luck. While black cats were considered lucky during the times of Egyptian pharaohs, later in Europe in the Middle Ages, black cats came to stand for evil and bad luck by being associated with witches. This myth followed the Europeans to America and blacks grabbed hold to it and believed what they said. Black people, black people don't like to admit that they avoid black cats when possible to keep it from crossing in front of them and causing them bad luck. Even if they just see a black cat, this stuff comes to mind. They suggest another subliminal reason to avoid and dislike the color black. Two, Friday the 13th or the number 13, as being bad luck, came from the same source. Friday was allegedly the day Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and got in big trouble with God. It was also said to be the day Cain killed Abel and the day Jesus got crucified. These days, some hotels do not have a 13th floor because so many Americans believe this number to be bad luck. Number 13 is like a terroristic threat, and when Blacks see it, they go the other way. Three, Crossing the fingers is supposed to help a person succeed at something, and it stands for a special prayer done with the fingers. This stands for making the sign of the cross, which is supposed to ward off evil with its magical powers. They are equally ridiculous, others such as throwing salt over his left shoulder, not stepping on a crack in the sidewalk, opening an umbrella in the house, splitting a pole, not washing clothes on New Year's, making sure that a man is the first one to walk through their door on New Year's, not letting a bird fly directly over his head, and the list goes on and on. Some even insist on eating black eyed peas, candy yams, hog jaws, and rice for New Year's Day because it's supposed to guarantee good luck for the rest of the year.
Some carry a rabbit's foot on their keychain, are happy if they find a four-leaf clover plant and hang a horseshoe over their door. Many study astrology, numerology, witchcraft, and voodoo. They become very well versed with these customs and each time they honor, submit to, remember, or practice any of these traditions from a European folklore, they immeasurably deepen their inner entrenchment and a heritage which has turned them into what they are today. The next time he completes the requirements to earn his college degree, he needs to remember one other thing as he pleasantly and profoundly marches down the aisle dressed in his royal cap and gown outfit. This especially pertains to those matriculating in some of our dignified historically black colleges. He should keep in mind that the head PC wears was originally worn by those in the academic community of medieval Europe. They used the colors of black, red, and purple to signify various degrees of, acknowledge, of knowledge. The transferring of the tassel signaled even higher elevation. The European bishops in the Church of Rome continue to wear their cap with the tassel in their matching gowns today. Perhaps soon a black man will search and find out what kind of symbol his black ancestors used to commemorate completion of an education and change to wearing those. Compulsory attendance in public schools victimized a black man in many areas of his cultural development and the required subjects rearranged his priorities and narrowed the possibility of him ever getting a chance to study his own history. He does not know and is not familiar with his own languages, but is offered Latin, French, Russian, or Spanish as a foreign language requirement for graduation or college level pursuits. The black man who attends Catholic school received the worst kind of brainwashing because even when separated from girls during their educational process, they were totally surrounded by images, pictures, and rituals alien to their African heritage. He was raised on a steady daily diet of praying to white male images, honoring the Blessed Virgin portrayed as a white female and worshiping saints and other religious representatives who all happen to be Caucasian. As part of his participation in the Catholic school curriculum, which was more strict and more civilized than the standard public schools, he still lost out in the end because Catholic school made it easy for him to forget about his own people and to work to blend in with white viewpoints. He became one of you guys or the fellas, and he was fiercely instructed to refer to his instructor as father, mother, or sister. He grew to believe he really was related to them. And his studies, and his studies consisted of daily classes on the Catholic religion with books filled with holy white men and women, saints. He had to memorize several names of patron saints to protect him, give him strength, provide for him, and take care of his family. He was taught that no matter what he needed or wanted, there was a white saint who had the religious power to give it to him if he turned to them in prayer. Based on the kind of intense brainwashing that took place in the black boy's mind in Catholic school, it was considerably worse than attending regular public school because he lost himself completely. Catholic school also reinforced the black man in developing a special regard and respect for white women because of the profound love they were taught to have for the Virgin Mary due to her being the saintly mother of Jesus Christ. All of their prayers begin with her name at the helm. They asked the mother to convince the son to bless them, and all the statues and pomp and circumstance during Mass was copied after European or Greek symbolism.